So I got a fun talk today. Um, one of the things that I think we're so fortunate to have is that you know, we're building off of a great academic tradition. And we're also building off the work of particularly great men. Um, you know, Louis von Mises and Murray Rothbard both were not simply satisfied kind of deal with, with the purely abstract and theoretical. I mean, both were men of action in terms of trying to engage meaning in, in meaningfully within politics in ways to actually bring about a world that more closely aligns with their ideological understanding of what a free and prosperous society looks like. And, and so one of the more controversial aspects of, of Rothbard's political strategy in particular was his embrace, his understanding of the powers of, of uh, populism as a potential force for good with libertarian circles. Um, so I'm gonna look, uh, I'm gonna flesh out some of the history of populism within the Western, particularly American tradition, uh, identify some of the aspects of the current political uh, environment, uh, look at some of the cr criticisms of populism uh, from other libertarians out there, uh, and then kind of outline what I think offers some uh, particularly interesting opportunities for us as Misesi and Rothbardians in engaging with this current political landscape. So of course, you know, I, I go without saying that you know, populism has been one of the big catchphrases of kind of political discourse for the last several years. You know, Brexit, you see it with other foreign movements, things like that, right? The question is, you know, what is populism in the first place? You know, because not only do we have it from Donald Trump, but you know, it's, it's described with Bernie Sanders, kind of left-wing populism. Left-wing populism is typically treated by the media a little more respectably than right-wing populism, which might play a, I'll give you some insight on where the true uh, elites stand. Um, we see it also in a, in a post-Trump age, right? The idea that populism is here to stay within the GOP. And this is not unique to the US, of course. You know, populists, uh, if you talk to a lot of Latin American libertarians, for example, they, they, they are repelled by the idea of populism because of the experiences of Chavez uh, in Venezuela. Um, but we also saw it with the success of uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, who actually was able to use his position to put in um, scholars with Mises Brazil in some positions of power that can't be dismissed out of hand. We also see completely non-ideological populist, or, or, this also presents the, ra the rising specter of you know, concerns about liberal democracy in Europe, right? This kind of starts with the Brexit, these nativist sort of uh, uh, rejection of EU policies. But we've also seen non-ideological movements entirely. I mean, this is Armenia. Um, they had an anti-corruption populist movement in 2018, um, which led to the formation of a non-ideological party as the governing party there. So again, there's, there's nothing ideologically uh, connected to populism. Um, so again, is, is populism a useful term? Um, here, we have the Atlantic asking if populism is useless because it's only a negative kind of slur. I think that might portray some of the biases within the Atlantic as an institution. Um, but there are some kind of common factors when we talk about populism. You know, they are, again, it's a non-ideological method. It presents society's political conflicts in an us versus them sort of dynamic, you know, the people versus the out of touch elite. Uh, this, this elite aspect is also important because typically the populist critique is not only is there an elite isolated from us, but they are growing increasingly distant from cultural norms of the people. Um, it is usually connected with the rejection of political norms which is one of the reasons for concern. Oh, you're breaking down constitutional order, uh, illegal institutions that are dependent upon for stability. So there's fear that populism leads to, dis uh, to, to disturbances in normal order. And also they typically involve a personality cult. There's a man of action that is kind of the catalyst that the masses rally behind. Uh, Joe Salerno himself, uh, kind of following that Rothbardian tradition has looked at kind of populism as a non-ideological vessel. Um, and again, I think this is reflected a lot within a lot of kind of the libertarian political scholarship, um, you know, the, the entire battle of winning hearts and minds. There's, there's interesting literature on the, the differences between the kind of what's called the Hayekian strategy versus the Rothbardian strategy. So there's, gonna, so there's a long line of, of work on this, kind of building on Mises' idea that, demo, that governments are always grounded upon the, the popularity of you know, the, kind of a perceived legitimacy of the population, right? And so again, if you understand that, then populism is simply kind of a, a weaponization of uh, the people recognizing how far the state has gone from their interest. So again, looking at the origins of it here, uh, we have Gaius uh, Gracchus, who was one of the two Gracchus brothers. In, you know, before the Caesar Caesarian era, you have this major issue where because of you know, increasingly expansionary Roman wars, uh, since the military was only uh, uh, if staffed by Roman citizens that had land, the more soldiers were away, uh, the, their, their families back home ended up having to sell their land holdings, which led to this consolidation of wealth. 
Um, and so uh, land reform um, was one of the major issues, uh, you know, kind of motivating uh, the populares. Um, the opposite, the elite, were the optima, uh, optimates, who were, you know, aligned strongly with the Senate of Rome. Uh, uh, Cicero uh, was a part of the optimates. Uh, Julius Caesar was a populist. Um, and again, this is true, even, even though, again, there was ideological differences between these two camps. They were not kind of traditional modern political parties. Again, it was, it was you know, questioning on what, what the structure um, you know, should be the leading actor in political Roman politics. Um, you know, earlier today, uh, Ryan McMakin brought the Levelers, which was also kind of a, a British uh, populist rejection of, in, in this case, it was the absolutism of parliament after, you know, during the, the first, you know, uh, uh, British Civil War. Um, but again, what, it had, what had happened was an increase of literacy amongst the common people, and from there, ex, you know, started, uh, um, you know, they were guided by ideologies of re religious tolerance, um, you know, and an embrace of, of markets, um, and kind of, you know, er, the origins of liberalism. You know, within the U.S. after the revolution, one of the big populist uprisings was Shays' Rebellion. This itself came from, you know, Former Revolutionary War veterans recognizing that the state governments were using their collective power to increase their taxes on the citizens, uh, to reward financial speculators with hard money rather than the devalued dollars they were collecting, right? So this led to a Shays Rebellion. That itself also had a, a you know, backlash, right? That helped you know, convince otherwise sympathetic individuals of the need for that constitutional counter-revolution that uh, uh, Patrick Newman uh, brought up earlier this week. Right? So again, there, there's, there are consequences at times for particularly unsuccessful populist uprisings. Of course, and and you know, the, the populist party, to the extent that it existed with how controlled and, and, and filtered democracy was in the early American Republic, is you know, best embodied by the Jeffersonians. Um, you know, the, these anti-federalists, these Republicans, you know, the political organization was a direct reflection of critiques on the, the Hamiltonian merchant class, right? And so from this, you know, again, they, they were a, a reaction to uh, federalist growth of the government went far beyond uh, these stated constitutional aims. They, abu uh, they, they, they opposed the first bank of the United States, which they saw as a, uh, uh, you know, one of the great uh, uh, distributors of state privilege of specific groups. Uh, and their response to this was cutting spending, cutting taxes, abolishing the bank. Uh, one of the things I, I want to kind of highlight is that even though we often think about kind of the great men of history, and there's valid, there, there's, there's some validness in that, uh, some of those historical perspectives. These populist movements were not simply one man, you know, fighting the man, right? Like, here we have John Taylor of Carolina, another figure of Patrick Newman's talk. Um, this is, I think I'm the first uh, Mises U presenter to be able to quote from Patrick Newman's new book. Um, it, it is a great one on this issue. But here, you know, you have also literature from other scholars that have highlighted that John Taylor's kind of motivating ethos for his economic policy was directly in rejection of the state privilege of the bank which they saw as a corruptive influence and divide, you know, further expanding you know, the, the wealth and power of a selected few at the expense of the common man, the yeoman farmer, as well as the idea of the American Revolution itself. Um, of course, kind of the, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, yeah, I, Patrick Newman mentioned this, you know, that the, the post-Jeffersonian era is really our first uniparty, right? The era of good feelings. We're told that we should celebrate this. This is some, this is us transcending the, this petty partisanship that plagues American populist, you know, politics, right? Of course, as Dr. Newman's lecture highlighted, you know, there was a lot of corruption during this period. We saw the moderation of the Jacksonian line, or the Jeffersonian line, um, which led to, uh, within uh, the, this party, the formation of coalitions that were explicitly uh, described themselves as radical Republicans, uh, Martin Van Buren uh, being one of them, but of course the leader of this was that man of action, Andrew Jackson. Um, I particularly I use this photo in particular because one of my favorites. Not only is he looking quite fetching here, but the uh, the title of this portrait is Andrew Jackson, Defender of Beauty and Booty. Uh, it was it was it was painted in celebration of his great victory at the Battle of New Orleans. I mean, again, a lot of the platform here is very similar. Right here we have an out of touch growing elite benefited by the state privilege of the National Bank um, and, the, and a, a uh, built up of, again, a lot of very interesting economic thinkers, such as William Gallage here, who recognized, again, this central institution as the center hub of corruption in American politics and, again, the betrayal of the values um, that America was founded upon. 
Um, Gouge is another one of those figures that I really like in Patrick's book because again, you know, when you think about American economists prior to the 20th century, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll think about Alexander Hamilton um, because all of the great economic theorists, right, the ones actually trying to understand how markets act, you know, they were newspaper men, they were politicians. They were not you know, in universities because that system hadn't built, been built yet you know, properly you know, in the European mold within America. And so these sort of figures that offer a lot of very interesting literature uh, kind of go overlooked. Gallagher in particular, he wrote a book about the uh, Piper money in the United States that was you know, widely dispersed in Europe. So again, like, this is a very interesting sort of proto-Austrian tradition in a lot of regards um, that, in that offers some interesting uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, rabbit holes to go down if you're interested in this topic. Of course, you know, one of the great victories of American history is, uh, is Jackson's defeat of the bank. I particularly love, like, you've got this, this demon guy over here, which I think is a proper um, uh, embodiment of, of the, the Second Bank of the United States. Uh, one of the great organizers behind Jackson, of course, was Martin Van Buren, one of Murray Rothbard's favorite presidents, um, who was a brilliant man. He was the son of a tavern keeper, you know, ended up building one of the most powerful political parties of his age. He had one great weakness, though, trains that look like William Henry Harrison. Uh, it, it's, it's funny, in, in this case, and, and Rothbard makes it up, uh, brings up this point that the, the, the populism of Jackson was kind of trumped by the populism of William Henry Harrison, which was very superficial. Right, he, he, he himself was a member of kind of an elite class, um, but they kept him out of the campaign. They made these, you know, they pushed this propaganda within newspapers about how like he's just a simple old country bumpkin that likes to sip, uh, sip on his hard cider, the great you know, uh, victor of Tippy Canoe, uh, and bringing with him Tyler II. Of course, unfortunately, shortly thereafter, American politics becomes defined by the American Revolution, or by the American Civil War. And then you have the rise of the, Jacks, uh, of the, of, you know, the Lincoln administration, and with it, again, not quite a central bank, but you have the green backers, you know, the green backs and, and, and you know, financial regulations that end up, again, creating some of the big issues here. Even more telling, though, is that if you think about this period of history, it's something we don't think about a lot. Here you had, after the Civil War, an America with states literally occupied by federal troops, right, a, a, a post-Civil War South. And within that, you also have the growing railroad industry, which is one of the most politicalized industries in American history because of its dependence upon land grants, right? This Republican Party was, it was perhaps the most corrupt, destructive party in American history, not simply because of you know, a, a revisionist views in the Civil War itself as a conflict, because in theory, right, in theory, you could roll back some of these extravagances of war if you really value the Union, right? There's there a narrative for that um, out there. The problem is, is that they weren't quite content with, they, they, there was no interest in rolling back, right? You, you started the, the, the rise of American empire. Um, one of the great conflicts within this, you know, a, a post-Civil War America, you had the rise of another very interesting overlooked free market populist tradition, which is called the Bourbon Democrats. You know, these are consisted of Southern Demo uh, you know, Southerners that rejected uh, post-Civil War policy, but also led by a man named Sam Tilden, who was the governor of New York. He was a great uh, uh, victor over, uh, Boss Tweed, which is kind of one of the most nefariously corrupt figures of New York history, which is probably you know, the state of the union with the, the most extravagant history of corruption, right? Um, but this entire tradition, again, went back to this Jacksonian era of railing against the central bank, promoting how to sound money as the surest way of tackling a lot of this corruption that was very apparent in the system. The problem is, is that at this point, the, the structures have become so powerful that literally the ele election of 1876, uh, the night of the election, everyone understood that Sam Tilden had defeated uh, a, a, the governor of Ohio, Rutherford Hayes. But that's not quite how it worked out. Um, the election was stolen. Uh, it was stolen in part because of a New York Times op-ed. At that time, it was a very partisan Republican paper. It kind of helped sow dis uh, a, a confusion about the results on election night that helped Ulysses S. Grant to mobilize federal troops to occupy ballot boxes. Uh, you know, Tilden's camp was said, hey, look, if you give us money, we'll give you the votes that you need. He was one electoral vote short. He refused to do it because it was his view that, hey, look, I'm running to clean up this corruptive state fueled by these financial interests. And see, this is what they want me to do. They want me to compromise before, just to get what I've already won. He rejected it. Well, he rejected it at his own peril. Um, we did have the rise of Hayes. The interesting thing about that, the, this, this bargain one of the aspects of it was that you removed federal troops from the South, but you also got, in return, the Democratic Party was allowed to appoint the postmaster general, which is where all the spoils was at. So again, it turns out the Democratic Party didn't really care about corruption. They simply wanted it to be their own corruption. Because of this, the Republican Party controlled American politics for 24 years. If they think about how much power that came with that, that move right there. 
And shortly thereafter, you have a breakup of what is, is, is a third political system was, was kind of the way it's looked in through political science literature. Um, one of the most interesting uh, articles on this period is actually in the Progressive Era book, looking at this very unique tradition. Um, again, another Patrick Newman uh, point he made in his lecture yesterday was about the pietists and the liturgicals. He, Murray Rothbard goes a lot in depth on that with his Progressive Revolution, or Progressive Era book. And of course, when we think about populism in the US, you know, often it's William James Jennings Bryant that is kind of seen as one of the, the great examples, right? He, he had the Populist Party. Uh, the idea of you know, minting silver was, was seen as a way of bailing out uh, uh, debted farmers. But what's interesting here is that the uh, uh, Bryant, uh, William Jennings Bryant taking over the Democratic Party changed fundamentally the ideological structure. Right? This, is, this is what kind of led to kind of the, the modern uniparty that uh, has, has kind of controlled American politics maybe until the Trump era of two interventionist, anti-free, well, regulated free market parties. Um, and again, in Rothbard, within a variety of works dealing with this period of history, like he talks about how um, you know, this was destructive of the laissez-faire tradition within mainstream American politics. I think one of the most interesting aspects about this, um, and something that, that Rothbard brings up, is that even though Jennings is called a populist, what we actually saw, for one, he never won an election, right? So apparently he really did not have the support of the people. But after this change in political systems, we saw a massive decline in electoral participation. And that's one of the, kind of the interesting aspects about this Rothbardian populist view is that in some ways it's a mirror opposite of something like the neo-reactionary, uh, anti-democracy sort of literature you know, out there in the conservative movement today. Um, it is from this perspective that it was the decreased interest of the masses in politics that actually helped allow for the larger consolidation of state power. And again, I, I, we're gonna look at some other trends uh, in, in the present day, but again, I, I think this is something that's very interesting here. Of course, the other great populist of American history is kind of the polar opposite of Andrew Jackson. You have Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, both of them have, I think, very important features aesthetically that explains why they continue to be, be celebrated figures today. The biggest thing is that they're macho, right? If, if populism relies upon the man of action, the strong man, Teddy Roosevelt certainly had that in spades. Um, but what's interesting is that even though he sold as this great trust buster, if you look at the actual history of the Roosevelt administration, which is covered, uh, there's two great short reads on this from Rothbard, um, the origins of the Federal Reserve and uh, something about you know, Federal, Federal Reserve, Wall Street, and foreign policy. He really goes down into the connections of how Teddy Roosevelt was a, a longtime ally of J.P. Morgan, you know, one of the great trusts out there. And again, you see this throughout Murray Rothbard's work of this era is that he identifies all of the, the large corporate powers that be you have the Morgan family versus the Rockefeller family. Um, again, this plays a very prominent role in kind of the, the creation of the Federal Reserve. And so again, if, if you're interested in this period of history, there's a lot of very interesting literature kind of naming names in this power elite sort of analysis. Of course, when we think about populism now, again, as I mentioned, what's interesting is that, you know, 20th century politics was defined by kind of the uniparty, um, a, a decline in average people being engaged in the system. And that changed to a large degree with Donald Trump. And one of that is because of him doing right there, right? Not only was he a billionaire celebrity real, reality, store, uh, reality TV star, um, but he was perhaps the most interesting account on Twitter. Um, but of course, within the kind of the Trump wave, you've seen um, you know, rises of other figures advocating for right, right-wing populism, such as Steve Bannon, um, and also Tucker Carlson, right? And of course, you know, what's interesting is if you look at the change in demographics, of the Republican electorate, what we saw was a massive decline of support from Republicans amongst like college educated right, white voters, the country club crowd that had long been kind of recognized as synonymous with the GOP. And in its return, we had kind of this working class blue collar coalition. Um, and we saw this reflected, I, mean, I think it was one of the last rallies that Donald Trump did in 2020. This is massive attendance rising from the masses. And again, we saw this play out, I, you know, as the title of this graph shows, the 2020 voter turnout is estimated to be the highest in 120 years. So again, this, this goes back, like this, this, we're now reverting back to a previous political system in terms of electoral engagement with the population. And I, I think this is interesting, particularly considering that you know, regardless of your thoughts about who actually won the presidential race, it is unquestionable that down the line, the GOP did remarkably well in congressional races, state house races, um, you know, the Senate was a little bit of an interesting thing. In theory, the increase of the voting population was always seen as a way of Democrats gaining even greater power, but obviously that did not happen in spite of, again, 120 year highest voter turnout. So of course, all this 
that we've seen Donald Trump, I, I'm sure I don't have to tell it you guys here, has created a lot of, of negative press uh, by certain institutions, right? You know, this, uh, alongside populist movements within Europe, within South America, right? Bolsonaro was described as the Trump of the tropics. Um, you know, you have all of the expected institutions of the regime, such as the Brookings Institute, identifying that populism is the threat of liberal democracy which given the actions of this past year, I find quite interesting. Um, again, this is not simply uh, Brookings, this is, this is a far, this is Human Rights Council, right? You see it also from uh, the Adam Smith Institute, which because of Brexit, I think rebranded itself from libertarianism to what they call neoliberalism. Um, and also we saw from, from Tom Palmer of the Cato Institute, who's perhaps one of the most vocal opponents of the threat of, you know, the greatest warners of the threat of populism in American politics. Um, and within this article, um, he makes the similar point that the Brookings Institute made, right? That this brand of populism that we're seeing emerge, that it threatens individual liberty, free markets, the rule of law, constitutionalism, the free press, and liberal democracy. Now, who here actually thinks we have any of these things? <laughs> right, they, they take at face value the propaganda of the state. There is nothing liberal about you know, a society that deplatforms political dissidents and that beats political uh, uh, prisoners because of a rally uh, and, 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 and of, uh, of the events of January 6th, right? And there's nothing democratic about a society where we see corporate, labor, national security agencies all conspiring for a specific a, a political outcome and changing election law unconstitutionally right before. You don't change the rules of a game and then expect people to take the game seriously, right? The biggest threat to all these institutions is not populism, but it's the actions of the technocrats that are doing everything they can to stop, that are worried about this populist out uprising that we've just seen in electoral behavior. Um, and what's also interesting in this is, again, it's populism is a big threat, but yet, again, if you look at uh, Cato uh, common, uh, content about Ron DeSantis and his actions this past year, you've got five articles. Uh, most of them are criticizing him uh, for, uh, uh, because the, the real danger is government getting in the way of vaccine passports. They're criticizing him for big tech issues. There's no, oh man, like think about how much liberty we save because one state, like, because a state like Florida of that size and that population stood against the tyranny of the technocrats this past year. Telling, I think. Um, Lou Rockwell has a term from the sort of libertarian like Tom Palmer. He calls him the regime libertarian. The regime libertarian believes in the market economy more or less, but talks about the Federal Reserve or Austrian business cycle theory gets him fidgety. His institute would rather invite Janet Yellen for an exclusive cocktail event rather than the Ron Paul for a lecture. It's too tough to be a libertarian when it comes to anti-discrimination law, given how much flack he's liable to get. And he'll side with left uh, liberals on that, even though it's completely incompatible with libertarian principles. He sips in happy concord with supporters of the most egregious just, uh, unjust wars, blood is, but his blood boils in moral outrage at someone who told an off-color jo joke 25 years ago. Um, I think we can add to this that, you know, there's a certain, so that the regime libertarian would rather be published in Bloomberg and the New York Times in defense of uh, lockdowns rather than be skeptical of the narrative here. To, you know, to be fair, though, to, to Mr. Palmer, though, his concerns are not simply about this protection of lower democracy. The real threat is often perceived as a, a war on uh, pluralism. Um, the idea here that you know, it, it is, it is the, the populism allows for a certain portion of the group to wield this political power against minority groups. Um, again, and typically, and this can be seen in, in, in you know, view of my, minorities, uh, financiers, et cetera, right, the 1%. Well, one of the things I think is interesting is that if we're trying to identify what might be that minority group of elites that are imposing their will on the people that should be rejected against, um, there's a very interesting uh, study. It's kind of a, a, a kind of transcends uh, typical left-right binary uh, uh, views called hidden tribes. One of the things I really like about this, it highlights like how much uh, political correctness and cultural issues uh, are, are motivating non-white voters, which I think goes against again, the narrative that we're often told. And here you see 8% is labeled as progressive activists. And it's these progressive activists that have outsized power in the institutions of the current regime. Um, what you see is that there, there is uh, the majority are not proud of American history. What you see is that these are very striking views held by this population, and they're views that are not typically held by other groups, even other uh, uh, you know, traditional democratic voters within this research. Um, com compared to average Americans, uh, they're, more, they're twice as likely to uh, list politics as a hobby 
You know, they, they, they're the sort of people that never give up Twitter. Um, they're more likely to be white. They're more likely to be college graduates or in postgraduate programs, right? So, so this is, I think, the demographic that if you're identifying like, what really is an ideological demographic that has outsized power in the current system, I think that there's some very interesting uh, uh, analysis highlighting you know, specific institutional power. And of course, one of the things about the Trump age is uh, you know, there's a lot of stories about the parallels between kind of Trump, uh, the Trump brand and Pat Buchanan's wing in the 1990, early 1990s. And I, I think there's some reasons for this politically. Um, the 90s were defined by kind of post-World War or po post-Cold War populism, or, uh, or post-World War, Cold War foreign policy. Um, that kind of helped split up like the, the typical Republican coalition of, of anti-communist hawks, uh, free marketeers, and cultural conservatives. Um, because if there is no Cold War menace, then again, that, that's one big part of that three-legged stool um, that might not be needed anymore. And so from that, you saw Pat Buchanan, um, who's considered kind of a paleoconservative, uh, an anti-empire uh, conservative with some questionable economics views. But what you had was the, the, the establishment of institutions designed for dialogue from, with, with the paleoconservatives and what became known as paleolibertarians. Paleolibertarians were the, 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 the fountainhead of that school of political tradition. Uh, it was Murray Rothbard and Lee Rockwell here. It was a creation of a number of, of institutions for this regard. You had the uh, Rothbard-Rockwell report. Um, the, there was a creation of the John Randolph Society, named from Patrick Newman's favorite Virginian politician, um, that had members of both the paleocons and paleolibertarians. Pat Buchanan himself was a member. Um, and so what's interesting, I think, is that we're, we're, if we're trying to identify how we as libertarians might be able to take advantage of this current political environment, we should look at the past. So here, the, one of my favorite articles, again, if you're interested in this topic, the, one, the first one you start off with is, is an article called Strategy for the Right. Um, in addition to converting intellectuals to the cause, Murray Rothbard said, the proper course for the right-wing opposition must necessarily be a strategy of boldness and confrontation, of dynamism and excitement, a strategy in short, of rousing the masses from their slumber and exposing the arrogant elites that are ruling them, controlling them, taxing them, and ripping them off. And there's an article recently by Ryan McMakin that kind of, uh, kind of expanded this point a little bit, um, the idea being that economics is a key tool in the culture war. You know, there, there's a lot of, of economists that kind of want to transcend. Like, and you see this also very, uh, uh, you saw this with Dr. Block last night, right? You know, his description of libertarianism was neither left nor right. Um, there are some libertarian scholars or some economists that, that don't like getting into those left-right cultural dynamics. Um, but Murray Rothbard, and, and I, I, you see this reflected also in the work of Lee Rockwell, like they recognized that one of the best ways to get our ideas out there in the general population is by appealing to cultural preferences and highlighting how the free market is not, does not destabilize the family, does not destabilize churches, does not destabilize these institutions that conservatives value, um, but instead complement them. Um, it's important to realize, Rothbard went on, that the establishment doesn't want excitement in politics. It wants the masses to continue to be lulled to sleep. It wants kinder, gentler, it doesn't want a Pat Buchanan, not only for his excitement and hard edge of his content, but also for a similar tone and style. I wonder if there's a, a modern American politician that this sort of description might apply to. Again, I, I think it's precisely the tone and the excitement of Donald Trump that end up elevating, again, the, some of these electoral trends that we've seen in the past couple of years. Um, so again, paleo-libertarianism as a libertarian coalition um, guided by the ideas of Mises and Rothbard, they identified some specific points um, that the, you know, the, Leviathan, the Leviathan state is the institution of evil throughout history, um, that it is a, the free market that defends moral and practical uh, institutions, that private property is an economic necessity as well as a moral one. Uh, that part in particular I think is important because often capitalism is defended kind of on purely materialistic grounds, right? You see this critique often come up like the populace right now is that, oh, well, you know, libertarians will sell out their grandma for, you know, a couple extra points on GDP, right? No, you know, we're not simply interested in the creation of stuff for the sake of stuff. Though stuff is very important, right? It's very easy to take for granted modern living conditions, but it's because precisely that free markets are morally strong institutions uh, beyond simply material gains. I, I think relevant with some of the growing uh, uh, inward turn from you know, the kind of, we see the tools of the war on terror now being the, the war on domestic terror kind of goes through the threats of the garrison state, kind of the use of the FBI within trying to, to prosecute Republicans in, in red states around the country. Um, and again, also explicitly anti-welfare state uh, as a way of, that you know, victimizes not only uh, the producers and the small businesses of the country, but also is detrimental to the clients, uh, the, the receivers of welfare. 
Um, again, a lot of this stuff is kind of libertarian stuff, but he, they, they combine with the cultural norms, a, a defense of Western civilization, the defense of Christian values, um, you know, defense of family, ch church, state, et cetera. And again, I think it's precisely the cultural outreach here that offers this as an opportunity to build coalitions. One person who was very effective at this is, you know, is obviously Congressman Dr. Ron Paul. Um, in 96, uh, uh, Congressman Paul had been out of Washington for quite a while. I mean, he ran for the LP in 88. Um, he got reelected in Texas in 1996 in spite of harsh opposition by the GOP establishment. Newt Gingrich was you know, flying down there trying to target this election in particular to stop Dr. Paul, and he, they, they, they couldn't succeed. Everyone knew that Ron Paul was a hardcore libertarian. He wasn't simply a country doctor that had you know, delivered 4,000 babies at this point, as he was able to kind of get away with in the 70s, right? People knew exactly what he was. And because he was able to build, you know, with the work of, of Murray and, and Lou, a much larger network. Um, and, and he saw this, I think, also play out during his presidential cycles, right? I mean, it was homeschooling moms in Iowa that were as rabid for Ron Paul, you know, as anarchists from uh, here in Auburn, right? And again, it's, it's broadening the power of these ideas. Of course, you know, there's no greater institution right now that I think drives a lot of the critiques that, again, this, this kind of modern populist movement has on capitalism as they understand it than the Fed. Right? This is one of, one of my favorite sites out there for kind of good propaganda purposes is uh, you know, W2, uh, WTF happened in 1971. They've got a great series of charts kind of identifying going off the gold standard as a, a big breaking point uh, kind of leading to the rise of the kind of financialization economy that we have right now. Um, you know, that's just where we can, we can talk about income inequality, the you know, uh, breakdowns between uh, uh, you know, output and wages. Um, we can talk about differences in, in real GDP, trade policies, et cetera, like, like that. We can talk about um, you know, consolidation of wealth. And what's interesting right now is that for all the critiques out there, you see this with Steve Bannon's, you see this with Tucker Carlson's, they'll rally against the venture capitalists, they'll rally against the chambers of commerce. The one institution that they don't talk about um, is the Fed. I, Steve Bannon just was recently on a tin pool, another kind of you know, Occupy Wall Street sort of populist. Um, and he, he kind of ignored this issue. And again, I think this is one of those opportunities where you get all of their critiques in society. You know, the critiques about uh, uh, the weathering away of like the one income household, right? There is a narrative there that we can tell as people, as Rothbardians in our understanding of the way that central banks and credit expansion play a role in the consolidation of power. Um, of course, you know, we've had some very interesting sort of uprisings within the current financial system, not simply in talking heads on TV, but we see this kind of, you know, the, the, the use of Wall Street bets uh, as a trading platform kind of targeting these large financial institutions. Um, and one, one of the, again, one of the criticisms is the consolidation of corporate power. Um, I think this is relevant not only to the discussion of big tech, or which I'm going to touch on here shortly, um, but kind of just generally, right? And one of the things that, you know, we, we, know, we, could, we should be able to understand as Austrians, there's a very interesting paper on this ver a particular topic, 2014, the QJAE, about historical trends of what was called merger waves and corporate consolidation within business cycles. And again, this makes sense, right? You, you, you make it cheaper for large corporations to buy up debt, or to take on debt. They then use that to acquire uh, competitors, right? You know, Facebook has spent the last decade, you know, acquiring Instagram and WeChat and, you know, what's, what's that? We have a whole, this whole variety of, of a network, right? Which can lead to further consolidation, uh, which then combined with the attention of Washington, ends up leading to this very destructive environment, you know, where the company, corporations that are the most, that benefit the most from state privilege right now, you know, even if they wanted to be good actors here, the danger is that, you know, rejecting, censoring Trump supporters, you know, increases the likelihood of penalizing regulations uh, from Washington, D.C. And, and I think this gets to a very interesting, uh, different dynamic in kind of the Republican Party as we see it right now, you know, in this populist era. We have someone like Josh Hawley, who was a senator, and perhaps because of his current position, there is a push for conservatives in power to utilize the weapons of the federal government to deal with, you know, Section 230, um, to try to, to use the federal government as a means of breaking up these institutions that they have identified as threats to, uh, you know, conservative values here in the U.S., and I, I, this is kind of the, the old Teddy Roosevelt approach to populism, right? It's trust busting to a certain extent. It's hostile to some corporate interests, but there's always, it, it's defending, it's attacking your enemies, but defending your allies, 
Um, and of course, you know, it's, it, when, it's interesting when you look at the, the backgrounds, the CVs of some of these people in high positions in uh, big tech companies, how often they have been uh, uh, alumni of the Kamala Harris Senate office of Joe Biden's administration, of Barack Obama's administration, right? The alternative to this, though, is kind of the Ron DeSantis approach. You know, the, the identifying something like big tech as an issue and then identifying that there is perhaps a role um, for state governments independent from that federal framework to take seriously some of these concerns that conservatives have. Um, one of the things that really frustrates me about this particular issue, and I, and I don't have the answer, there's, 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 there's not a clear answer on how you break up this consolidated wealth. Um, but you have some really bad arguments out there against the DeSantis bill in particular. And I think it stems, this misunderstanding of the difference between the state approach versus the federal approach can be devastating to our cause. Um, so in this article, um, whose author is not particularly important, but the, um, within it, the, the comparison being made to justify what is a standard libertarian view, right, that property, uh, is he, he draws a comparison of Facebook to a wall. And now imagine you have this wall that you've built. And people now can draw on your wall. Banksy comes and draws on your wall. But somebody draws something on the wall you don't like. And then you paint it up. And then, oh, this big, bad authoritarian Ron DeSantis is telling you that you can't have that on the wall. Like, oh, this is, this is an infringement property. Of course, comparing a wall to big tech misses the point. Like this, these are not similar goods. Particularly with like, the American tradition of political discourse. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you've had others kind of say, oh, this is the, the, the biggest infringement upon First Amendment rights we've ever seen. The, the Florida bill in particular kind of focused purely on registered political candidates. And you see this with the, the way that newspapers, tele, cable companies, or, or cable stations, radio stations, there's, there's, there's always been equal time laws when it comes to political discourse of can register political candidates because there's an understanding that in a democracy where elections do matter, um, that if you allow for one side to control the discourse, there's going to be political consequences that do not lend themselves to that liberal democracy that we're supposed to be intent on con conserving, right? So again, there's plenty of issues with the Ron DeSantis approach. Like, the guy that wrote the legislation clearly doesn't understand how algorithms work. Like, you know, I'm not defending this as this is the ideal libertarian perspective. But ultimately, I, I think as libertarians engaging in this populist world and dealing with the fact that we're living in an economy with the Federal Reserve giving, among other aspects of federal policy, large, powerful corporations hostile to American interests. Um, state privilege, the, the very aspect that motivated that 19th century populism, right? We need to engage with it seriously. And as, as Frederick Bosiot said, the worst thing that can happen to a good cause, such as the cause we are here for, now, it's not to be skillfully attacked, but to be ineptly defended. And again, a lot of commentary on this issue have been ineptly defended. And, and you know, this is important. This is an issue that matters. I mean, imagine right now what the American empire is. I mean, it's perhaps the most perverse form of empire that we've ever seen. Because at least in history's past, empires, you know, expanding territory, you get the tyranny at home, you get expansionism abroad, but there's a certain national pride, you know, right, that came to being a Roman citizen. But here in the US, you know, we, we have an empire that gives, disrupts abroad, that terrorizes us here at home, and yet wants to deprive us of even having pride in the American tradition. And it's precisely because that American tradition is baked in the ideas, and the ideology, and the populist of classical liberalism that they so hate. One of the other interesting things about this environment is that we're, we're now living in an inflationary, you know, we, we've seen last few months inflationary environments, and historically, inflation is a very major driver, very influential in politics. Um, you know, we, we saw protests kind of on this regard. You know, you, you used to have, uh, 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 back protesting uh, interest rate hikes from, from Paul Volcker, you know, people sending like wood in saying like, oh, well, no one's buying houses because of your interest rate policy. Um, so, you know, have at it. And this is particularly right now an environment where, you know, luckily a lot of the political discourse out there in an inflationary environment where money really does matter, where spending is an issue, 95% of all political pundits have nothing to say, right? They, they've been acting in this economically nihilistic environment for the last several decades. And so this gives us opportunities to identify again who the enemy is, what should society look like, and, I, and, and preach sound economic policy to identify how our methods achieve the means that these populists want. Um, and I, I'm, I'm gonna finish up with a, uh, two quotes, one from Louis von Mises here. Because one of the things that is important here, and you see this throughout kind of Mises' views on ideas in society, right? Going back to that idea of the popular government, um, you know, he viewed economics as something that should not simply be confined to academics talking about theoretical papers. You know, it should not be isolated to ivory towers. You know, what we need is engagement from the population to understand at least basic economics. If you understand basic economics, you're more economically literate than the experts of the Fed. 
um, you know, that's one of the purposes of Mises University is to help provide a very deep uh, uh, background in this to a variety of different disciplines. Um, but it's also up to us, and you see this throughout the Austrian tradition of engaging with normal people. You know, Henry Hazlitt himself, right, was a journalist. Carl Menger himself was also a journalist, right? Like, we, we have all these great historical figures um, that we should recognize, their, you know, to take from their example. You know, if, 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 you know, great movements are typically led by men of action, one of the greatest uh, benefits that we have as Austrians is that we have great men that we can emulate. You know, we have Ludwig von Mises. If you haven't got it, uh, download the, the, the uh, biography of Ludwig von Mises as a, free audio, uh, as a free audio book. It's one of the best things out there. Um, but also Murray Rothbard, right? Th these, are, these are brilliant men who took great personal, uh, who, who gave up otherwise potentially very lucrative and powerful careers in defense of the ideas necessary for building civil, civil society. And it's precisely because the weaknesses of this current political environment come from an understanding of economics developed by kind of the current public school apparatus that doesn't want you to think like an economist. This makes our role here as people that engage in the political environment all the more important. Um, I'm going to leave you with, with one of my favorite Rothbard quotes, because uh, I was told to, to end on a, on a cheering note. Um, again, this, this, I think, again, speaks to the fire with which Rothbard did so much of his intellectual work. Um, you know, America as it exists today is two nations. One is their nation, the nation of the corrupt enemy, of their Washington, D.C., of their brainwashing public school system, their bureaucracies, their media. And the other is our much larger nation, the majority the far nobler nation that represents the older and truer America. We are the nation that is going to win, that is going to take America back, no matter how long it takes. It would indeed be a grave sin to abandon that nation and that America short of victory. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mises Institute is here to make sure that we can do everything we can in pursuit of that victory. Thank you very much.